Um, and so if you go back to the, the base level of where you have all of your, um, all of the, the notebooks, and now we'll move on to the pet one. These aren't uh, very computationally expensive, so if you want to run it inside of your virtual machine, you can do that, and if you want to do it on the cloud, you can do that too, really, for this one. It's, it's however you want to do it. Everybody got it up running? Everybody happy? Everybody awake? Johannes is perfect. All right, so uh, if you have a look, there's a README, and the README just gives the order of the ones of sort of... Uh, Obviously, we'll start simple and we'll build it up in terms of complexity. So uh, the very first one called Display and Project is um, uh, the start of the introductory one is, is this. So we'll start very quickly over that and then we start getting to projections and from there on we'll start getting into more exciting topics. All right. So if you want to go to the Display and Projection uh, notebook, it'll look something like this. And feel free to, so I think we did all this um, in the introduction. So you've got all of your, uh, all of the imports, which presumably are looking quite familiar by now. And then, uh, and then some functions. So for example, we've got one which is called imshow, which we're going to be using for, for displaying our images. And then we've got two more, one for making sure our, uh, taking the absolute of all of our voxel values to make our, our images positive, and then want to add a sort of a cylindrical um, uh, field of view so that anything's out, outside of that cylinder, we'll set it to zero, which is pretty useful for if uh, anything's outside of that scanner uh, geometry. Anyway, uh, then we'll CD into where we have all of our, our um, pet data. So if you want to just uh, execute all of that so far. This should all be, I suppose, uh, pretty familiar. And with any luck, it should be working for you guys. Happy days. All right, so uh, now we're into the correct uh, folder, and uh, and what we're going to do here is we're going to um, we're going to create a temporary folder called a working folder. That way we can mess around with whatever we want, and then once we delete it, we're back to, to where we started from. Yeah. And then so all of this stuff you should have seen earlier. Does it all look pretty familiar? It looks pretty easy. Yeah. So uh, open an image. It's going to be pet. The reason why I was here earlier, we said import surf.stir as pet. And for those of you that saw my presentation yesterday, we said the, our motivation was to make packages interchangeable. And so in Python, when you import things, you can import them and then give them an alias. So I could say import surf.stir as pet, or if in the future at some point, maybe another pet reconstruction algorithm, uh, like package, something like Castor, was uh, wrapped, then in theory in the future you could go import surf.caster as pets, and then you'd hope that if we've done a good job, all of the code that you've used would be uh, more or less the same. So that's why you would, uh, you would use aliases. So from now on, whenever we want to use uh, the stir, the wrapped stir functionality, we will use that, that pet uh, keyword. So uh, create me an, an image, and it's in, a, it's in the, uh, the alias pet, and it's going to be, you know, it's a file called emission, whatever. Uh, we've got a mu map, which is going to be another image. So um, Stir uses uh, what's called the interfile format often. And for an interfile format, a, uh, the image and the, the metadata and the volume are stored as two different files. So you've got the .hv that has all your header information, which is why there's an H and the .v, which will have the volume stuff. And then for the acquisition data, so for your sinograms, you'll have a .hs, uh, which is the header for the sinogram, and the .s, which is the raw data for that. So um, if you see anything that's uh, labeled hv, it's probably an image. 
So you, you should use pet.imageData, and if it's .hs, then it's probably a sign and so you want to say um, pet.acquisitionData. All right? So if you want to execute some of those cells, here you can see that you're calling help on the image data. And uh, does this all, did, we've, we've so, so far we did all this in the introductory bit, right? We've done all this, right, yeah. So you can just, you'll see all of the methods which are available to you. You can do filling, you can get uh, empty copies, you can uh, do all sorts of stuff, all right. You can even get the, the voxel sizes. Um, so we'll skip over this li a little bit. Here you're doing some maths. You can multiply your images by certain values, and then you can see that the value is going down. You can either do it as where you say, get me it as a ray, and then you're messing around with it as a NumPy array. Or if you're working in MATLAB, you'd be working with sort of the uh, inherent MATLAB object, and you could do the multiplication that way or the addition or whatever you want that way. Or equally, you could leave it as the image data, so you could leave it as the wrapped object, and you could do your maths on it that way. So this, this, these couple of lines are just to show you, you can do it whichever, which, whichever way you want. And then we use that imshow method that we had earlier, that we defined earlier for showing our images. All right. And then I'm saying, get me my voxel sizes, tell me what voxel sizes you are. All right. So I think that's where that one stopped. And so now we get into forwards and backwards projection. And you'll have seen it a couple of times already for that. We use, um, in SURF, we use the terminology acquisition model. The acquisition model is the, the object which is capable of doing all the forwards and backwards projections. And so I have to tell it which particular type of acquisition model I want it to use. Well, I want it to use the ray tracing matrix. Uh, Chris talked about all the, the ray tracing matrix and the, uh, the lines of response and, and that sort of stuff. And then the last thing I need to set up is a, um, is a, is a sinogram. To tell it, if I'm going to do a full projection, I need to tell it what that, the form I want that projection to look like. And so to do that, I could use a template. I could use a real sinogram if I had one. In this case, I don't have one, so I'll just use a template where it just has all the information of um, the metadata that I want it to project into. All right. So once that's all set up, you're good to go. And you can do your first forward projection. So here I'm saying uh, acquisition model, do me a forward projection. And I want you to forward project this image and we'll end up with uh, acquired data, which is of the form. Can anybody tell me? Uh, it's a sinogram, yeah, sorry, that was a, it was a hard question because the answer is an acquisition data, um, <laughs> which is obviously a question that you couldn't know the answer to unless you've messed around with surf a lot because uh, so we store all of our, our sinograms in the form of the class is called acquisition data. So then we can see um, all of the methods which are available to the, uh, the acquisition data. And it shall be uh, similar to uh, what we saw for the image. So there'll be filling, there'll be getting me copies, there'll be some maths in there. There's, um, you can get the dimensions. And you'll notice here that um, our sinograms will always be returned in four dimensions where the first one is our time of flight bin. So currently SURF doesn't support time of flight, but we've put this in so that in the future it will be able to, which means that that first dimension is always gonna be a singleton, i.e. it's a four dimensional thing where the first one is always gonna be, just have a size of one. So if ever you want to get your um, sinogram as a 3D block, you would just say, get me the zeroth index because Python, in Python you use uh, zero indexing in MATLAB, you use one indexing, but you'll just say, get me the zeroth uh, time of flight bin, and you'll just get that 3D sinogram. Yeah, everyone with me? Um, I think that's it. So here, we've got that rebinning method. So this is how you could get your 3D sinogram down into a 2D sinogram. And I think we won't use that today, but we will use it tomorrow when speed is more of the essence, when we're doing more exciting um, algorithms. So you can take your 3D sinogram and reduce it. You don't necessarily have to go 2D. You can just reduce its obliqueness, but you, you have those sorts of choices. And so here, if I say print me the shape, this is what I was saying just before, where you've got your, uh, the number of time of flight bins equal to 1. All right? Sinograms? Pardon? Uh, I forget the order of the uh, it's sinograms, views, and then tangential views, uh, tangential, tangential position, sorry. So this is obviously really small data because we're just trying to go quickly in, uh, in for something like the MMR 
uh, it's, it's much bigger. I mean, for, for any real data that you would be constructing off the scanner, it would be, it'd be much bigger. So, uh, what does it mean for it to have 11 cyanograms? Um, let me do some thinking. Tangential positions is a long, no. The, the tangential position is the distance of the line with respect to the center. Mm -hmm. Views is the angle. Mm -hmm. And cyanograms is a mixture of stuff. Uh, because you, you have your, along the scanner, you have your different axial positions that you want to take into account. But then mm -hmm. also you have the lines that go this way. Mm -hmm. And that is, gives you a non-uniform rectangle or thing. And so manufacturers and we tend to just stick them one after the other. So if you had a 2D cyanogram, it would just be as many uh, slices in, in that oblique, in that non-oblique direction, in that um, cross-sectional to the, to the, along the axial uh, position of, of your scanner. Yeah, so if you have n rings in principle, you can have n square cyanograms. You have all the possible uh, combinations. Okay. All righty. Uh, so we've done a forward projection, and then we can we can display that. And so here you can see that I've said, get me the zeroth time of flight bin, uh, and then the sinogram number I've taken about halfway down. So that will be, what, our fifth or our sixth or whatever. And then I'll show the whole of that. And that should look pretty familiar to what Chris was showing in his, uh, in his slides. Uh, sorry, I forgot that you're looking at a video of mine. So let me know if I'm moving around quite quickly, and that might mean it's quite jumpy for you. I don't know. Is it OK? It's all right. Um, all right, and then the, the next one is, is just uh, creating a small visualization as you're going through the different views of the sinogram. And uh, last and, uh, uh, but not least in this one, we'll do a backwards projection. So we'll take the, uh, the, pro the data that we've just forward projected, which we saved in as uh, acquired data, and we'll do the backwards projection of that. And we should end up with a a uh, much more blurred version of our input image. Yeah? Yeah, I guess I forgot to, to mention that in the slide. So the back projection operation is the transpose of the forward. So you have your acquisition matrix A. The back projection is multiplied A times A transpose. And that comes when you do the MLEM formulas. So you have it in there and any, any operation is ready. That operation is in there. Uh, if you do a filter back projection, it's related to this operation, but there are some, some tricks to do in addition to that. But anyway, but so because it's, uh, it's not a back projection is not an inverse in MR, it happens to be the inverse as well, which is the basically fully sampled data. Your full projection is a Fourier transform. Mission conjugate of that is the inverse. That's what you've had. It is the line integral, and the back projection of that is some put everything over that line thing again. So everything that uh, you need to correct. You scroll just a little bit up. So I, I noticed this is still with the, with, I guess, with the old data. Uh, yeah, just more. If you so the movie shows you this is the top of the brain that we have only in the data not the whole brain. And you sort of see yourself rotating around it. If you maybe can convince yourself that you can see that better, you have to, you could do that exercise with the larger data tomorrow. Sure. Um, so, and I, I suppose everyone who works in PET will already be familiar with this, but for those that don't, just as a, as, as a, a brief recap, if you had, uh, if you do your full projection, you end up with sort of the, um, the sum of the activity along that line of response. So then if you ask it to backwards project, it doesn't know where. If you have a, a perfect point source right in the middle, you'll then say, well, I'm, I think the activity is all the way along this line. And so that's why you end up with a uh, smooth image. Yeah? Good. So that should be fairly easy and straightforward. Everyone with me so far? Yeah? Great.